All right, so good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, perspectives on ground segment uh, digitalization. So uh, organized uh, by Euroconsults and where I will have the pleasure to uh, exchange today with uh, Frederick Simons, uh, CTO of ST Engineering iDirect and Paul Tingman, uh, Senior Director of Spectrum Technologies for Microsoft Azure Space. Ultimately 40 minutes, uh, where you're certainly um, invited to ask some questions. You would have an interface available for that. And uh, we'll try to peek in on, on some of those questions as, as we exchange. So uh, before entering into the discussion, obviously the purpose of uh, the INC Insights webinar series is to look at uh, some of the disruptions, key dynamics happening in the satellite sector and looking especially at disruptions that will make satellite connectivity and satellite-based solutions relevant in the ICT ecosystem through, uh, through this decade. So as everyone would be aware, uh, one topic when talking about uh, satellite network and space infrastructure is how to bring the solution and services in the end of the end users. And there's no way out of using a ground segment and the most uh, efficient possible ground segment uh, that could get created. Uh, why we are here today, for those who may not be familiar with Euroconsult, uh, we have been uh, providing strategy and technology advisory for customers around the world uh, for a number of years now and for the entire uh, brace of space activities and enabled solutions, while we in parallel provide market intelligence uh, training for various organizations as well as organized executive events. Uh, coming uh, to the topic of today and just giving a bit of background as we are about to start the discussion. Uh, just looking at what's happening and what's converging now in the space sector. Uh, certainly software defined is a buzzword in the industry, but it's also very much a reality. Uh, just looking at the satellite component in last year, it's approximately or more than 70% of geo satellite ordered that have so-called uh, software-defined payloads on board. And if not first generation, that for sure would represent all of the second generation NGSO broadband constellation currently under preparations. And I will talk further, certainly this comes together with software-defined and increasingly virtualized ground segment, but I will keep that for the discussion. That comes also with a, a massive increase in capacities that will be uh, deployed in the coming years. So as we estimate here over 90 terabit per second, but also in terms of actual use of connectivity on a daily basis, the industry has certainly entered into the terabit era and data consumption should increase at, the fast, at, at a fast pace. And it's not just obviously a matter of volume, but it's a matter uh, of flexibility in terms of options for allocation, dynamic allocation of those capabilities um, for a variety of users and over time. Uh, integration with terrestrial networks capability for the end user experience, it's certainly clicky and I've no doubt that we'll come back to this through the discussion. Uh, looking at, at two to three other directions for the industry, uh, mobility actually could be considered in, in dif from different angles. One could be from obviously the NGSO constellation moving against us, even if the end user is in a fixed location, or looking at the fast increasing number of, of uh, mobile assets, obviously a lot today being ships and aircraft, but increasingly also looking at uh, land uh, uh, options for trains or, or even other land vehicles. Uh, applications, I believe certainly a need to increasingly look at the different application layers and to manage in a different way uh, the various applications used by even a single end user. And as a final trend coming together with technology innovation is a transition in actually what's being offered by the different space organization with different forms of new service integration and certainly in the direction of managed services and whatever the definition of managed services that we could consider for just the next few years. And as I was mentioning, I believe that a lot of that is converging 
as we speak and for the next few years. But I also tend to believe, and, and there it's where I will open the discussion, that uh, part of that future has to be enabled through adequate and innovative uh, grant segment. And sorry, just uh, stopping the sharing of my screen to turn now to Frederick and Paul um, to welcome maybe your first comment. And I would say first comment is in the trend we see in terms of transition to the cloud already and some of those items. Uh, what, just to start with that, what in your view it means for the space industry and how this can actually enable some of the transformations that I was referring to. So uh, we would want to take those, those first few words, uh, Frederic or Paul. Pekka, maybe I'll start just Paul. as the, as the uh, cloud person on our esteemed panel here. Um, so there's a couple of things that I wanna just set the stage with. Um, the first is really defining the cloud because um, it, uh, I think we all have a concept of what the cloud is. I've been at Microsoft now almost three years. Uh, what I thought the cloud was when I came to Microsoft and what I now know it to be are, are vastly different. Um, so a quick education for the audience, you know, we tend to think of the cloud as these megawatt class hyperscale data centers that exist globally. And then of course the network infrastructure that supports them. Um, while that's true, there's really two aspects that are key that as we look at the, the impact of cloud in the space industry that we have to embrace. Uh, the first is that cloud isn't just those megawatt class data centers. Cloud also extends to the edge. It extends as we'll discuss, I think throughout this panel to the ground segment site itself and compute infrastructure that's there. And so we call this hybrid cloud. And so it's really important to recognize the impact that hybrid cloud will make on the industry. But it's also to recognize that um, cloud is more than just a infrastructure. It's more than just a bunch of computers. It's a collection of services that you can composite together quickly to you know, accelerate your business. And for the space industry, we can look at the lens of operators and. Think of things like uh, Microsoft's Power BI platform or its AI tools, where you can garner insights about your satellite network um, you know, that can make it more efficient and build those tools very rapidly. Um, or we could look about uh, look at things like DevSecOps coming into the satellite industry. Um, I personally, I think I get a new version of Office 365 once a week, um, maybe more often on my computer. That's a vast shift from when you used to get, you know, an annual or biannual update of a piece of software. And so being able to sort of embrace that, uh, that new development paradigm that comes along with cloud adoption, I think is going to be really important for the industry. Thank you. And, and maybe Frederic, uh, rebounding on that and, and your uh, vision about it or starting obviously I direct has, has taken a number of initiatives in that direction and towards virtualization so just to start maybe with with your vision and building on what Tom, Tom just shared yeah so I, I think that the biggest shift for the space industry is that we're moving from a model that has been around since ages where basically Companies like us, the technology providers, we deliver equipment or we deliver appliances to our customers being service providers, being satellite operators. And those customers, they take in that equipment, they host that, and then they build a service around it. And I think the biggest shift is that this model is changing both for us as well as for our customers. So we will gradually move away from delivering equipment to delivering technology, delivering virtualized technology. And our customers, they will no longer take in that equipment, but they will actually run those uh, virtualized technologies on infrastructure that is not necessarily hosted by them anymore. So we rely on, on partners like Microsoft and, and other cloud service providers to provide that infrastructure on which we can deliver our technology. So neither us, uh, nor our customers need to, to worry too much about that infrastructure because obviously it's not our core business to deliver servers and to deliver cloud abstraction technologies and so on. 
there are other players in the market that are much better at that. Neither is it our customers hosting infrastructure and running that and maintaining that is also not our customers' key focus. They should focus on providing end-to-end -end connectivity and, and providing the best quality of service to their end customers. So I think that's that's for me is the biggest shift is moving away from this appliance appliance equipment model to a more virtualized technology delivery model. And um, yeah, as Paul explained, as an add-on, you have immediately access to a whole bunch of new services that are out there in the cloud uh, domain, let's say, uh, the ones that Paul mentioned, like AI, other tools to manage networks, which can be leveraged uh, as an add-on uh, when making that transition. Thanks. And, and coming with that topic of cloud, obviously, comes, uh, as you mentioned, the topic of virtualization. And I think, Paul, had we even exchanged earlier, uh, you may consider that, that what is to happen now in the satellite industry is, is somehow what has happened to the mobile industry a few, a few years back when thinking of network development and, and so forth. So, yes. I mean, but right right now we're going through I what I think fingers crossed will we'll hope is an accelerated version of what we've seen the terrestrial wireless community go through the last decade. Um, exactly as Frederick mentioned, you know, moving from appliances that were in telco data centers and telco edges to to compute infrastructure. Um, so we get the benefit of all those lessons learned. Uh, you know, Microsoft is uh, very active and has made large investments in uh, 5G technologies for the wireless telco, uh, the terrestrial wireless telco space. Um, we now hope to bring all of those lessons learned and all of those technologies into this market and help the space segment, you know, go through that same um, transformation, but, you know, more rapidly. And uh, you, in your introduction, Becco, you mentioned really that if we look at the satellites on orbit, going on orbit today, they're predominantly software defined. Um, and so, you know, when we think about virtualization, we think about a few key things. Um, you know, one, yes, it, you know, it needs to put us on a path to lower total cost of ownership for operators that then, of course, reaps benefits for, for customers. Um, but two, sort of embracing the software defined nature and making the ground segment as flexible as the uh, on orbit space segment and going from, you know, manually slewing beams on the earth and manually apportioning circuits in a ground station to, you know, all of that going through completely dynamically hands off um, in an automated fashion. Um, and, you know, fundamentally, we, we know that this is a, a hard change. Microsoft went through this with the networking community when we were building the cloud and we went from, you know, hardware network switches to software defined network switches that are now so common. Um, so we've been through this journey, you know, in different industries before, and we think we can really help the, the space segments, you know, move quite quickly through that same journey. Thank you, and, and Frederick, so certainly you may want to elaborate a, a bit more on that uh, kind of system approach, so with that question of the end-to-end -end, uh, uh, flexibility uh -huh. or defined capability, and and jumping on that, I believe that you, you've also put in phases uh, quite a few times where I heard you, we could exchange also on the question of standards that will be important for, for the industry as well to uh, transition to what may be the, the new normal in the next few years. Yeah, so maybe first on, on that flexibility, I, I agree with Paul. I mean, there's, again, a big shift happening on the space segment side where satellites that were launched 10 years ago, they were designed upfront for a specific purpose, a specific coverage, a specific application that they wanted to serve. Now they're completely software defined and Actually, the business case can completely change over the lifetime of the satellite because that satellite is fully programmable. And obviously, if you have that flexibility in space, uh, the least you can expect is to have the same flexibility on the ground. So our customers also don't want to deploy infrastructure for one specific purpose. Uh, if the, the business case changes, if the application changes, if the geographical coverage of the space segment changes, we need to be able to move that ground segment as well. And that's that's the flexibility uh, that, that you get with, with moving uh, that technology into a more cloud environment. And if I uh, if I see it correctly, actually, from, from what I could see, some 
first, uh, let's say, concrete deployments of a virtual ground segment was almost a bit earlier in Earth's observation because of the nature of the very bumpy traffic with, with right. the pass. And actually for telecom, it may have, have, have come just a bit after because those new space infrastructure were also needed to fully leverage maybe what, what virtualized ground segment could offer. So as I see it in the next two to three years, those, those two components are really working end to end in, if they want to have a global system capability. Yeah, we, we, we obviously, we don't like that Telco is coming after Earth observation <laughs> because we're I think for, for once, I think it may be uh, yeah, but, 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 yeah. but, but you're completely right. I mean, earth observation from a communication point of view sure. is very occasional use in the yeah. sense that uh, they do a lot of processing and they, they download from, from the satellites uh, at, at certain moments in time, not in a continuous way, which is the typical telco yeah. application, which is more 24 seven type of traffic, which uh, while in earth observation, uh, it's more scheduled, it's, it's more, uh, but indeed that same flexibility, you also see it start coming in the telco world eh, where uh, capacity is managed on a, on a day-to-day -day and even within a day basis. Uh -huh. eh, when you, for instance, see airplanes moving from east to west and from west to east on a certain moment of the day, uh, you see that the capacity will also completely move and which can also imply that the ground segment, the amount of beams that are being created, the amount of beams that are being removed is also becoming completely flexible. Sure. So, uh, so, so indeed, that's that's something that is becoming more similar to what is happening already in the Earth observation world. Indeed, I'm Pekom, I'm glad you brought up Earth observation because I, I, um, you know it's something that we're doing today completely virtual. Microsoft just announced you know Azure Orbital Ground Station. A, a, an Earth observation service that we run where we have both first and third party antennas that are directly connected to the cloud. And you know, our, our network, our, our uh, Microsoft infrastructure is all virtual. Um, but as you mentioned, the, you know, you're going from a very transactional nine to 12 minute satellite pass um, where you can even tolerate disruption. If you have a failed pass, you'll pick up at another ground station sites, you know, um, in, in not too long, you know, an hour maybe, um, to something that's 24-7, 365, highly redundant, needs to be able to handle failure. Um, and um, uh, uh, this is a this will be a challenge for the community to really elevate what we're doing in Earth observation, blend it with what's happening in telco virtualization, um, and you know, make the telecom portion of the satellite industry, you know, ride this virtual wave. Yeah, and understanding that we are, we are talking space infrastructure, we're talking ground segment, but obviously moving forward, we might see as well more of the inter-satellite links or other forms of transmissions that will have to be managed in, in a dynamic way, kind of kind of end to end, I, I believe. Um, maybe jumping back on, on the question I had a bit earlier about, about standards, because obviously part of the question of the integration as well of, of uh, the space capabilities will, will be also the ability likely to have a more standardized uh, approach and the ability typically in, in 5G to be more embedded with, with terrestrial networks. So, um, I know actually both both Microsoft uh, and uh, ST Engineering iDirect have been involved uh, in either 3GPP or uh, either in the digital IRF, sorry, IF interoperability consortium, uh, DIFI may be easier to um, say it that way. So just maybe giving some perspective on, on the stakes or criticality of those standards in the transition that, that, you, uh, that you anticipate. So I, I think there's several aspects yeah. of standardization and why standardization is important. One is cost. Um, yeah. So, you know, ultimately standards help us get commodities of scale and without commodities of scale, software can be just as expensive as hardware. So vir virtualization isn't a panacea in and of itself without standardization that comes along with it. And, you know, there's, at least as, as we're seeing it, there's two key aspects. Um, there's adoption of standards from adjacent industries, 3GPP, like you mentioned, and 
Um, release 17, I think, yeah, of the 3GPP standard is a really good example of the blending of terrestrial and non-terrestrial telco and starting to see you know, support for non-terrestrial networking you know, coming out of these larger terrestrial standards bodies. Um, but we also have places where you know, we need to innovate on our own, fill the gaps, embrace that space is unique. Um, you say DiFi, I say Diffie. Maybe we can. Uh, maybe maybe that'll be an action we take up in yeah. the consortium is to figure out is a, is a, is a maybe. <laughs> pronunciation. Um, but you know that's that's an example where um, you know as an industry we came together. Um, Microsoft and iDirect are both part of of Diffie that uh, Microsoft co-founded, and it's a recognition that. You know, we needed one standard way to talk to digitizers and one way to transport RF data as digitized into the cloud. Um, so really, you know, standards really do need to be a blend of both adopting what makes sense that's in market that can get us economies of scale, but, you know, in finding the gaps also recognize that as an industry, we need to band together and still standardize within those gaps um, so that we maintain those economies of scale. Yeah. Uh, yes, and, and actually for DFI, then I think uh, this year has also seen the, the convergence of two actually working groups that used to be separate and then it's been aggregating a larger number of, of uh, stakeholders. So uh, Frederick, maybe as well, your, your perspective and, and from either standpoint on, on that contribution to, to the standard definition. Yeah, well, actually, uh, like you said, there were uh, initially two initiatives uh, being started up exactly at the same moment in time, just to show how much interest there was. But of course, we realized that if you want to standardize, uh, you need to have one standard, not two. So we immediately merged those initiatives. And I think it's a very important initiative because we're trying to replace something that has been around for a long time, which is basically an analog <laughs> Co between uh, between modems and antennas and things like that. So we we want to replace that with something digital, and obviously we need to make sure that all players in that field, uh, be it uh, RF manufacturers, uh, books, LMDs, uh, as well as as modem vendors, which also can talk the digital interface, whether that modem runs on dedicated hardware still or whether it's completely virtualized. And and running into the cloud, you need to have a common understanding of how those samples, how those RF signals will be trans transferred in a digital way. So I think what we're doing now, what we're seeing, and what you will see also in the next coming on months, is, is vendors starting to adopt and to, to use those and support those standards on their products. That will be a very interesting moment then when you will see these demos, and then we will also launch a few in the coming months where we will demonstrate that our modem technology can talk over a Diffie interface to an RF player's infrastructure so that you can actually realize that promise of a digital teleport, which is basically a teleport without any analog cabling, without any RF switch matrices, without any splitters, combiners, amplifiers, all stuff that, that works well, but is, is very painful to maintain uh, and, and mistakes are, are easily made. If we can digitize all of that, it, it will simplify those teleports a lot and also will create a lot of opportunities because it will, much, will be much more easy to, for instance, reroute traffic from one antenna to another. So there are plenty of advantages, apart from the fact that you can run everything with respect to the, the modem technology into the cloud. I think there's some other advantages uh, related to the fact that you can digitize that, that teleport. So that, yeah. that's, why, uh, that's why we're obviously fully engaged also in that, uh, in that Diffie standardization and adopting it uh, on, a, on a product. Yeah, and understanding, uh, well, I, I may elaborate a bit on, on the future of the transition path. I assume that uh, at teleport level, this this will have to come together actually with the consideration of of uh, regulatory or security or concern or specific clients. So it will be that that ability to both move to a, a virtualized environment, but potentially as well manage uh, different components that you may have in in the same teleport actually or same facility. So the two shall kind of 
work end in end, I believe, depending on customer or end user expectations uh, using using the networks. Um, maybe uh, turning also to uh, to obviously uh, the, the partnerships that that Microsoft uh, Azure and, and I direct have announced already uh, uh, well some some months ago or not so long but it's like a, a couple of months already almost now um, you know what what has been and maybe just to give a, a quick summary of uh, the rationale or direction for this partnership I believe uh, some of the thinking behind uh, where you feel it's important. Um, and maybe on top of that, then Paul as well, I know that Microsoft had that ecosystem view at building such partnership in different directions. So happy to hear you elaborate on this. So. Frederick, do you want to start and talk a little bit about? Very, please. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, so yeah, obviously it's our vision to gradually move our technology into a cloud environment. And one of the most difficult things to do uh, in that transition is the modulation and demodulation parts, which is highly computational intensive, signal processing, error correcting coding, things that are, let's say, very complex, require a lot of resources if you want to run them on, let's say, a plain CPU type of architecture. So what we wanted to demonstrate is that you can actually achieve high high throughput and that's that's important because when, when it's low throughput it's easy but we wanted to demonstrate that you can do high throughput modulation and demodulation in a cloud environment and we we partnered with microsoft there uh, to demonstrate that you can actually run hydrax modem and and uh, so modulator and demodulator technology in a microsoft azure environment where we actually make use of the hardware acceleration that is present in that cloud environment. So it's not a pure uh, CPU type of environment, it's more a hybrid environment, but it's completely running on, uh, well, it, it's it's running on Microsoft's cloud. So there's no equipment, there's no hardware involved anymore from, anymore from iDirect. So that I think that's an important proof point that, that most computational intensive part can actually move to a cloud environment and everything else should be easy compared to that. So I think that's that's what we wanted to demonstrate. Um, and yeah, once we have done that, we will also start productizing uh, some of our technologies into a cloud environment, starting with the most trivial things, which we basically already do today. It's like the network management software can be run in a public cloud environment. Also the network processing stacks will then move into a cloud environment. And then finally also the baseband or to the modulation and demodulation, uh, we'll move into a cloud environment, and that's what we're uh, that's what we're prototyping, or that's what we're demonstrating already today. Yeah, so it's I, I think Frederick, we've it's almost been a year since we've announced our partnership, and um, you know what we decided very actively early on was yes, we 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 tackle the hardest part because yes, there are lots of aspects of virtualization um, that you know move beyond just converting hardware to software. Um, you know, when you actually start to take advantage of the cloud environment, as Frederick mentioned, you, you, you need to tap into elasticity, which is a key concept in cloud that if you're not using resources, they can contract and you know, return to the resource pool that you have a, a service-based architecture. But um, th those are all you know, very easy hurdles to tackle. And, and some of them iDirect is already tackling um, after you've tackled the biggest and hardest problem, which is virtualization. And um, going back to earth observation, you know, we have earth observation modems that run at lower data rates that are all software today. And what was really important in, in the work that we've been doing through our partnership is to get to that high data rate, is to get to that FPGA accelerated, because ultimately, you know, embracing this from a telecom sense, as opposed to earth observation sense, it's it's really important that we can do those full data rates. Um, now, one of the things that I come you mentioned that I want to touch on is um, really looking at this through the lens of an ecosystem. So Microsoft has done this digital transformation in, in lots of different industries, um, and um, the the key is always 
for Microsoft, looking at ourselves as a platform company, looking at ourselves as how we support a whole ecosystem, you know, done right, you know, we want to support the entire space industry and lift the entire space industry up, not just one specific player. And the way you do that is you work with, you know, great companies like iDirect, the people that already support the ecosystem of that industry. And we help get them onto Azure. We help accelerate their applications. We make sure that, you know, where, where and when we find issues where the, the cloud doesn't actually, you know, support those applications in the way it needs to, we go address and, you know, basically build additional capabilities in order to accelerate what we're doing. And so um, at the end of the day, you know, what's really important for Microsoft is that we have not just iDirect, but iDirect and, and the rest of the, the vendor community on uh, the Azure cloud on our platform so that we have that complete ecosystem that all the satellite operators will need ultimately to build these digital ground segments that we're talking about, build them efficiently, effectively. Thanks. And, um, you know, coming back and maybe to uh, not the start of the discussion, but, but thinking out of the development to the benefit of end users or trying to get a few examples of what will be enabled typically to certain use cases, and I'm sure certain of them are already uh, uh, on the testing, if not uh, uh, available already. But thinking also what you mentioned about uh, the edge capability of some of the new flexibility capabilities that will be offered to for, for end users. So would be happy to hear from you, Frederick, or, or, and Paul on a few thoughts or a few actual use cases where you see concrete benefits for certain of the enterprise customers or, or maybe even government customers are certainly we're working in a very large, uh, servicing a very large breadth of, of end users for satellite connectivity. So Frederick, maybe I, I can pick on one that I think we actually put uh, in our demonstration video um, and, and that's uh, public safety and justice, first responders, um, people that need to establish connectivity where connectivity either isn't present. Um, you know, uh, let's say wildfires tend to be fought in areas that are very remote and not uh, high connectivity rich, or after a disaster uh, infrastructure, you know, can, can be wiped out and offline for days, weeks, months. And so it's, it's important not just to be able to bring satellite connectivity into those areas to, to reestablish or to coordinate, but um, to do it rapidly, right? So if we go back to this idea that, you know, we actually need to rapidly establish service. It, it can't be deployed over, you know, a time frame of days or months. We need to push a switch and, and have it, you know, very, very rapidly. And so, um, that's a great example where the kind of dynamics that we're trying to enable with virtualization and with uh, cloud um, really come through so that the services can be created quickly. And if we go back to, you know, um, the fact that the cloud is really a platform, a service platform that you can build new capabilities on, um, you can also look at that as how do you compose together additional capabilities that the cloud has in order to rapidly build the right service set for the customer. So maybe the customer doesn't just want layer two service, maybe they want layer three service, and then maybe they need a particular network connectivity pattern. They need a certain set of virtual networks, they need firewalls, they need security infrastructure. All of those things are, are virtually deployable in the cloud environment. And so you can go from that core, you know, layer two service to a very complex, enterprise network architecture very quickly quickly by deploying additional services on top of this virtualized ground segment in the cloud. Okay, and if I, if I hear you well, that, that would effectively also transform some of the, let's say, uh, legacy way of working that was quite largely about typically a fixed three, five years contract with essentially constant capability over that time frame to something much more uh, upgradable through through the period of time, depending. Yeah, on the, uh, uh, your uh, absolutely. So um, you know, there's maybe two aspects to that. One is technologically, can that connection that you've procured 
change over time. And I'll go back to my comment about DevSecOps. You know, yes, like we can we can think about how we repeatedly change and deploy uh, the infrastructure around that connection to build really not just the connection itself, but you know, from Microsoft's perspective, we like to think about this entire industry as, you know, you're trying to move data from somewhere on the planet to the cloud to generate some insights, right? And so it's it's about that entire service chain and, and not just about the connection in the middle and really being able to look at that end to end as a cloud uh, uh, a cloud resource. Sure, thanks. Yeah. And through the week, please, yes, from. No, I was also going to say it's it, again if you look at it from what our customers, what the satellite operators, what the service uh, providers, what they host uh, when, when creating a connectivity service. I think a lot of that equipment, what it is today, it's not only the satellite communication platform, but it's everything around that uh, Paul was mentioning, uh, or you were mentioning the layer three services that you want to create around that uh, deep packet inspection, maybe an SD1 layer, uh, maybe an integration into 5G core network. That becomes a lot easier if all those technologies can run on the same platform. I think that's the that's the easiest way. And if you if you later on want to change for something else, it's you just stop the subscription of that particular uh, service and you 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 use another service uh, to to kind of create a new end to end connectivity uh, for your customers. So it's that flexibility not only for the satellite communication platform but for everything you need around that to build that end-to-end -end connect connectivity service towards the end customer. Thank you. And um, I'm just uh, keeping an eye on some, some questions we received and actually one that maybe about, you know, deployment and starting to look at, at the next few years. So one is really about the, the capability building standards, some items you men we, we mentioned already. Some of it is also obviously about the transformation of facilities or teleports and then process work and so forth. So. Uh, one question I have, but where I may enlarge the, even the topic a little, you know, the, the question is about the maximum length inter-facility links can have in digital IF architecture, but maybe even a bit beyond that, obviously, uh, in places it may lead to rethink a bit the topology of actually antennas next to a data center, or what is a teleport about, what connectivity is needed in those various locations. So what is your view of what's needed as well there? For, for the, the network to be progressively actually transformed into that new uh, one? It, it, it's a good question because indeed you need to look at the entire topology of your satellite communication network. Uh, so DIFI has a lot of advantages as I explained. Uh, it has one drawback is that uh, the amount of throughput you need or the amount of megabits you need to transfer a certain amount of information bits, let's say is much higher than when you're just sending out these information bits. That's because you kind of digitize a waveform yeah. and you need to do that very, very accurate. So that comes with, let's say, a higher number of bits per sample, just to go a little bit technical. Yeah. Um, so you, and, and as Paul mentioned, that's where you need that hybrid cloud environment that you don't want to transfer uh, data uh, digitized from a teleport a few hundred kilometers to a centralized uh, data center because that would be very costly in terms of transfer cost, in terms of throughput that you need. So you really need to process these at the edge, close to the teleport, uh, but that's where you have this distributed architecture. Right? So the, the typical modulation, demodulation um, technologies or functions, you would run very close to the teleport. And that's where you also terminate then the Diffy interface. And that can run um, on any type of hybrid cloud environment. And then the other functions, the more high layer network stacks, those you can centralize. Uh, but the co communication between that uh, modulation, demodulation, and the network functions is already at a, at a decreased rate because you have already uh, processed the modulation and the demodulation uh, at the edge uh, closed close to the teleport. So these are things to take, in, to take into account. I don't think there's a technical limit in how far you can transfer a Diffie signal, but it just, there's a, there's a commercial aspect as well. You don't want this to become uh, excessively uh, expensive, of course. So that's why you need to make sure that you process the right type of function at the right uh, geographical location. 
I, I think Frederick, you hit the yeah. nail on the head. It's it, and in fact, when we look at the cloud, the hybrid cloud as a, a architectural platform and how you distribute, you know, ultimately what we're going to end up, you know, today is a hardware modem appliance. In the future, we'll end up calling it either a, a virtualized or a cloud native network function of some kind. Um, our approach is that you know those can be deployed in the hyperscale cloud back in our you know large regional data centers or all the way out at the edge and you know our our goal and our, our what our platform does is it really abstracts you know where those actual network functions are deployed and so then you know yes you can start to fundamentally shift the topology of a, a ground segment but you do have to overlay cost on it and you know Diffy, if you if you look at the actual data bits encoded versus you know the the digitized waveform, um, there's a ten depending on you know how complex the signal is. There's a ten to forty x increase in in data volume to move the digitized data. And so um, today, absolutely, yeah, we see that the, the cost causes things to swift uh, swing in the direction of demodulating in a hybrid cloud environment at the edge, but then, you know, your, your choice of where to put the rest of that networking stack, as Frederick said, is you know, some of it could live at the edge. It could all live in the cloud, some combination thereof. Um, so it, it, it really does introduce some really new, interesting topological decisions for operators as I look at how they build their ground segments. And, and, and I believe obviously that the level of maturity of satellite organization obviously can can vary depending on their size number of space infrastructures they have so i believe that a, a, a component of that is also try to work with them or end to end so to even help them or work with them to think of those typologies are actually on what's required in the what would be their ground facility of 2025 or, or even before yeah um, yeah I see. I see that also as one of our roles is to I is to help design these digital teleports and how the topology should look like. Uh, because uh, yeah, I think we at both both companies like Microsoft and ourselves, I think we have the unique knowledge about how to build these type of networks, how to transfer those analog signals in the digital domain, and and this is certainly some kind of service I think we need to offer to our customers as well to help them build those those uh, future teleports let's say or those future uh, satellite networks thank you so i i see that we're already uh, pretty close to to the time we uh we had for our discussion today so uh before clothing still and looking maybe at the next two to three years or what you see as being on the critical path or just trying to project ourselves three years out uh you know what 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 is your expectation on that journey for for the space industry over that time period. So maybe, maybe I'll start, but um, I, I think we, we should look at two time horizons. And so let's start with two to three years and then we can look, you know, what does the next decade look like once we once we clear that two to three years. But um, the next two to three years, I, I think, you know, I, I put sort of the criticality around um, demonstrating or moving from sort of uh, demonstration proof of viability uh, to product grade to you know hardened services and the the reason I say that I I, lo I love that you introduced Earth observation into the discussion earlier like we we know how to demodulate signals in software like this is um, this isn't in and of itself a hard problem um, the the challenge in front of us is to bring those capabilities in a hardened fashion into a highly available um, computing substrate. So what happens when inevitably a digitizer fails? Do we, how do we dynamically reroute that signal to a new virtual modem uh, to be able to make sure that that customer doesn't get impacted? What happens if a computer fails, right? How do we make sure that we have either the ability to rapidly or on demand create new virtual modem resources to service that connection. It's, it's handling that, that shift from, yes, it is technically feasible and, and doable to how do we actually do it at scale? How do we not just do it on one computer, but how do we do it on compute clusters 
you know, for an entire digital infrastructure around the globe. And so I, I think that's the progress that we're going to make as an industry in the next two to three years is we'll, we'll climb and summit that mountain. Thank you. And, and uh, Frederick may be embedding into, into this question a very pragmatic just that popped up, so it would be final one I can take. But um, with regards to DeFi or DeFi products or leveraging the standard, uh, when do you think uh, you know, users can anticipate to have DeFi capable products where the standards really uh, integrated? Um, when, when do you think such products could be available into the market kind of? Yeah. So we well, think about, you know. I think it's also in that same time horizon, two years, maybe three years. And the reason I'm saying that is because to really fully benefit of Biffy, you need to have it supported on all parts of the ecosystem. Yep. Um, you can, if, if you have digitized your modulator, uh, but your RF equipment doesn't have a Diffy interface, then you need to put a digitizer in between which makes it a complex setup. But I think in time frame of two, three years, you will see uh, antennas supporting a digital, maybe flat panel antennas, those are the easiest ones because they are typically already processing uh, the signals in the digital domain. So they will have digital interfaces, but then later also the more traditional components like books and LMDs. And once you have that, then you really have a lot of value of, of using it. I think the digitized is a good intermediate solution. Uh, but the, the really end goal is to go digital all the way to the outer unit, all the way to the antenna. And uh, so once all those players have it, then I think is when you will actually see commercial traction and you will see it being used uh, in, in operations. Thank you. So I guess that may be our final word. Uh, I'm sure the discussion will be ongoing and we can certainly have an update earlier than in three years on, on the matter <laughs> with everything happening. Um, so just as we are about to close, uh, just to let, uh, you know, just to tell that this session obviously has been recorded and will be, make, uh, will be made available to all uh, the subscribers to this webinar and even maybe even beyond that. Um, and uh, as we close, would like certainly to thank very much uh, you, Frederick, and you, Paul, for sharing your insights today. Uh, that was very interesting, uh, including for myself, where I learned a lot, certainly. So uh, looking forward to, uh, to the progress of uh, both usage of cloud and overall virtualization of ground segment and of the global space capabilities. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye.